everyone, in person and on the web. I'm Ann Linton from Hemel Farm Health Sciences Library, and I'd like to welcome you to our updates in scholarly communications, publishing impact and visibility. Today we're going to be discussing experiences with open access publishing, and we have a very, very esteemed panel to discuss that. While we're waiting, I will go ahead and introduce our panelists without their names being up on the screen. Let me start with Dr. Rajiv Ramal, who is a professor and chair of the Department of Prevention and Community Health in the School of Public Health at George Washington University. He is a recipient of the Everett M. Rogers Award in Public Health Education and Health Promotion, awarded by the American Public Health Association. Dr. Ramal has 20 years of experience in health communications and risk communication research. His work seeks to understand how individuals process risk information and how, so how societal norms affect human behavior. His recent work has investigated how stigma toward people living with HIV and AIDS can be reduced through the media, how media and community efforts can empower young girls in Africa to remain healthy, and how communication theory can be used for effective HIV prevention. He has a Bachelor's of Engineering from Bhopal University in India, a Master's of Arts in Journalism and Mass Communication from Southern Illinois University, and a PhD in Communication from Stanford. Dr. Ramal serves as a peer reviewer or a member of the editorial board for a number of health, health for a number of journals in psychology, public health, and communication. He has published extensively, and most recently he published on the differential effects of an opt-out HIV testing policy for pregnant women in Ethiopia when accounting for stigma in the journal Prevention Science. Next up, we have Dr. Lauren Maggio. She is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine and the associate director for technology and distributed learning of the graduate programs in health professions education at the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences in Bethesda. Dr. Maggio completed her PhD in health professions education in 2015 at Utrecht University in conjunction with the University of California, San Francisco. She also holds a master's degree in information science from Simmons Graduate School of Library and Information Science. Dr. Maggio is especially interested in exploring how to effectively connect health professionals, learners, and patients with information through the design of educational initiatives and by facilitating access to knowledge for public and professional use. She has published extensively in open access journals and has served as associate editor of the public access journal Perspectives in Medical Education. At the very end of our panel, we have Matthew Bendel, a graduate with an MS in biology from Brigham Young University, who is now pursuing a PhD in biomedical sciences in the GW IBS program. He is interested in computational biology and joined the Nixon Lab in January 2015 to develop methods for the quantification of genomic repetitive elements in collaboration with Dr. DeMolder. In 2015, he was co-author of the article, Composition, Taxonomy, and Functional Diversity of the Oropharynx Microbiome in Individuals with Schizophrenia and Control. I got it all out. And um, that was published in Peer J, an open access journal whose mission is to efficiently publish the world's knowledge through internet scale innovation and open access licensing to save you, the author's time, money, and to maximize recognition of your contributions. Matthew was also published in another open access journal, PLOS One. So he'll be giving us a student perspective on the open access field. Okay, finally, second from last, we have Dr. Travis O'Brien, an associate professor of pharmacology and physiology in the School of Medicine and Health Sciences. He graduated from Bowling Green State University and has a PhD from the University of Cincinnati. His lab has two areas of major, two major areas of research interest. The first is elucidating the molecular mechanisms of carcinogenesis for environmental chemicals, and the second is investigating the genetic and epigenetic factors that impact fertility and predict response to ovarian stimulation therapy. He has also published in open access journals, including BMC Genomics, and last year I wanted to highlight an article he published in Blood on novel genetic predictors of Venice, Venus thromboembolism risk in African Americans. And the reason I wanted to highlight this is it was open access. It was very basic science, and it's still got an altmetric score of 61, which those of you who know about altmetrics and basic science, that's a very high score. So clearly an article that had a lot of buzz and impact in social media. These are our panelists. We'll leave this up as they speak. I wanted to introduce just a couple of slides to people who are online, 
And the first is to talk about what is open access. And I use Charles Bailey, who's a scholarly publishing librarian. And he describes open access as journals that are scholarly, utilize quality control mechanisms, are digital, freely available, and allow authors to retain their copyrights. What I liked about this is he's talking about the immediacy of open access publishing, but emphasizing that the quality can be maintained. Librarians also have another group called SPARC, the Scholarly um, Publishing Research Initiative. And they also emphasize the immediacy, but their emphasis is also on the fact that open access allows ideas and breakthroughs to happen more quickly because research is published more quickly. Peter Suber, who's a librarian at Earlham University in the UK, is a big proponent of open access, so I thought I'd bring up a couple of the things that he says are reasons why open access is good. And that is increased visibility and impact for authors. Your work gets out there faster, it's read by more people. Readers can get to the literature without any barrier access. So there's barrier-free access to the literature. It's said to be good for libraries because we have ever-increasing subscription costs and this helps to deal with that. Funders like it because their research gets out to the public faster. They get to see the results of what they funded more quickly. And universities like it because they can draw a broader research profile and push it out there. So the result should be scientific research is more readily available to other researchers, teachers, students, and citizens, slash patients. I like the way PLOS One put it. It's accelerated discovery, public enrichment, improved education. So these are the benefits and the reasons behind it. But all is not perfect, and I think we'll hear about both of those things from our panelists today. Um, it's not free. It's just that the, we call it the author pays model. There are article processing charges that fund open access, and the question of who pays for them is an issue of some discussion and concern. So generally, funders will allow you to pay for open access. You can put that into your budget when you put up forward a research grant, and they will fund it. The rest of us who don't have lots of funding, we've got to scramble to pay those article processing fees. There's not a, a clear answer about that. Um, there has been a rise in predatory publishing. We did have a workshop on that earlier this month. And predatory publisher, publishers are basically publishers who take advantage of the open access model to get you to pay article processing fees for journals that are of low quality or maybe even a scam. So um, there's a, a negative side to open access publishing. And Publishing itself is just in complete evolution right now. So where we'll be in five years, I don't know. Will we be all open access? Will we go back to a traditional model? Will everything be broken up? We're going to hear from our panelists about that. So for those of you who are at home and want to follow up a little bit more on this, here are some resources. We have research guides in the library on open access publishing and pub predatory publishing that you can refer to for more information. Um, we will make these slides available when we make this presentation available. Uh, Sherpa Romeo. And DOAJ, the Directory of Open Access Journals, are both places where you can go to identify legitimate, non-predatory open access journals. So I thought you might like to have that. And since generally, in the open access model, publishers let you retain copyright in your articles, I thought you might, might, might want to read a little bit more about the Creative Commons licensing that goes behind publishers maintaining copyright and ownership of their intellectual property. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our panelists, and each of them is going to speak a little bit about their experiences with open access publishing, hopefully tell us where they think it's going, why it's important, or why it's not important, and then hopefully you all have lots of questions for our panelists. And do I have a volunteer for, to go first, or should I just point? Okay, Dr. Ramal, would you like to start? Um, thank you, Anne, for that uh, nice introduction um, to the open access uh, vocabulary, I guess. Um, I, uh, I made some notes about uh, some of uh, my own experiences in open access publishing. and just wanted to share that with you. So um, I, as Anne mentioned, uh, there are lots of pluses um, associated with open access, the primary one of which is that it is open access. And lots of people uh, for whom this was, this otherwise would not be accessible, uh, the, these articles, um, can benefit from this. Um, and in that large umbrella, I put many of my uh, international colleagues in uh, the developing world um, 
who, for whom having that access makes a huge difference. Uh, and uh, together with that group is also um, uh, our collaborators in this country who may not be affiliated with a university uh, to have access to journals that now, um, uh, who now have access. So I think it's, it's wonderful in that regard. Um, it's also great from a publisher, from an author's perspective in, the, in that the reach of these articles is greatly um, uh, amplified because of open access um, uh, journals. Uh, and for many uh, young professors and academics um, who, for whom um, uh, things like, you know, reach and how many times they've been cited and so on and so on matter in their promotion and um, uh, uh, other kinds of incentives that they receive from universities, I think it, it greatly helps. But there's also a darker side uh, to this, uh, one of which is something that we have, I'm, my colleagues and I have experienced directly, which is that it's pretty expensive. Even in regular journals, uh, it's not unusual to have to pay in the range of about $3,000 to get an article published. Uh, so it's a huge burden. Um, uh, as Anne mentioned, funders increasingly pay for this, but that means we have to A, get funding, B, have had the foresight to put this in our budget beforehand, uh, and uh, even when funders are willing to fund this, uh, what I have found is that it does create restrictions in the sense that, so right now we're being funded by, one of our projects is being funded by the Children's International Foundation Fund, which is following the Gates Foundation guidelines on open access requirements that all their fundees um, uh, uh, publish only in open access journals. And, uh, you know, we budgeted for two or three articles, but I know that the project is large enough that there could be nine or ten articles coming out of it. But we are, in that sense, our hands are tied. We cannot actually publish in non-open access journals. Uh, but I think there is room for, and I'll stop after this, um, I think there's room for universities to take a lead in how this is shaped for years to come. Uh, I think many universities, including ones like ours, where research is a very big uh, portfolio, can set up resources so, and provide incentives so that uh, their um, faculty take on editorship roles with maybe some of the funding, the costs being borne by the university itself so that we, we're not stuck with a $3,000 entry fee. Uh, and that fee could be um, drastically subsidized, I think, if universities like ours take a lead in making that happen. Um, so I'm going to just share some of my experience. I think that I interact with um, OA in a couple different roles and they hit on. One is as an author. So I've had the opportunity from grant funds to pick up the, the author processing charges um, for a few different journals, so PLOS. Um, and then also in a relatively new journal called BMJ Open. One of the things we're seeing is that many of the large publishers, Nature, BMJ, um, they are actually bidding off um, open access publications, and they are using the same quality controls and criteria for those journals. Um, so those have been very positive experiences. I've also had the opportunity to publish in what I would call a hybrid journal. And I'll also let you know, my background is in library science. So I spent 10 years um, at Stanford's library helping them to purchase their collection. And basically, when I say a hybrid journal, um, the journal is academic medicine. It's a subscription journal. Um, but it was very important to us that we make this particular article open, which is about Wikipedia. So we paid the fee. We were also very anxious that it would be uh, a particular type of license. So instead of paying $3,000 for a vanilla license that restricted some of our access, we paid $5,000 to get it. So it could be completely open, a CC0 public domain article. That was a little bit painful off of an education funding. Um, the other role I play is as uh, a reviewer. So probably every, all of us here serve as reviewers who donate our time to do that. Um, I've begun to look very critically at the different journals that I review for, and I will favor journals that are open. 
it's actually been an interesting experience because many of the open journals not only are open for you to read, but they make the peer reviews open in their time. So I review for BMJ Open and for um, BMC Medical Education, and my reviews are completely open. So you can see my all of my suggestions for revisions throughout the um, throughout the, the publication cycle. So it's really interesting just from an education standpoint. It's really interesting to see how a manuscript goes from what gets submitted to how what shows up in in the press. Um, so that's that's another trend in open. The nice thing about these open publications is they're trying to make everything about it open. So they're transparent about the publication cycle. Transparent, you can access the article. And even in many cases, like in PLOS or BMJ, you have the open access to the data set. It's kind of becoming a larger ecosystem. Um, the other role I play is as an editorial uh, board member for a journal. And I've been very active in advocating that we move um, towards more open access, making certain articles open. And I also accepted a post as an associate editor for uh, Perspectives in Medical Education, which is actually, um, it's free for authors to submit. And they retain their copyright. It's actually funded by a scholarly society. And so this society decided that they wanted to fund the journal. They felt it was important enough uh, that they would pay all of the article processing charges. And it's run through Springer. Um, so that's a goal open access journal. I call it open, open open to put it in and it's open to read. Um, and that's been an excellent experience. And I would say I had been an editor on other journals and I spent just as much time, energy, love, and attention on those articles that I did in a subscription. The last piece, and then I'll finish up, is I study open access. So I'm really interested in thinking about, especially in the health space, how physicians interact with open access information. You know, I spent a long time, I led the evidence-based medicine curriculum at Stanford. I would teach those students to go into our library subscription and really push them to use all of our great content. You know, some of them are going to move to rural practices or to hospitals in inner cities that just didn't have those subscriptions. And so I started to wonder, well, what happens out in the wild with physicians who use, um, who want access to materials? So I ran um, a national randomized control trial. We got NSF funding for it. We gave access to physicians to our Stanford library for a year, and we watched, well, what do they do? So if you give it to them, will they come to it? Um, we found that they came about two times a week. It was highly cyclical, dependent. Maybe they were on service. Maybe they are writing paper. Um, but it was an interesting way, and it was our way to start chipping into this and to start showing value for open access, um, not just for people to read, but people to actually bring it into their healthcare practices. By all means, I have expertise. Yeah, that's the um, I, I think that all the pros and cons have already been mentioned in terms of cost. I think predatory publishing, I, I was thinking, you know, uh, colleagues are speaking, I don't think the day of the week is going to go by where I'm not asked to be on the editorial board of some Joe's journal of policy development. I think that's, that's, the, that's kind of the opening up of the whole process and the preparation of all these online journals. That's, that's the downside. But I think that. Any investigator worth their ability to review any papers and pick out the journals that are a bit dubious and don't go there. Um, so I, the way I stumbled about this actually was I was, uh, had a paper submitted to a non, I think they're open access now, but a traditional journal. And I had a back and forth, uh, an intellectual discussion back and forth with an editor about a reviewer and he got set up with it. I was hunting for a journal. So I'm going to find a journal in this area. Me a long time to look, and they all were open access. And I actually found one that I you know, was investigating to get was published in there and kind of uh, getting away from the fact that there's all these new journals that have been around long enough to really have anything that was negotiated. Um, I was happy with it. And so uh, we, we were able to come up with the funding uh, in, in our grant we had at the time we had the funding for this planning on it. Um, and, and so we were able to do it. Um, as Ann mentioned, other papers come out, um, and I think that's the benefit of my experience in open access is the visibility. You know, I mean, even to this day, when I, there are certain journals I'll look up and I have to email colleagues at other institutions, NIH, who can get them relatively easily, there's still this restricted access to a lot of things. Even in an institution like ours, as you mentioned, it's very expensive. Um, there's only so much you can do. So I think you know, the whole process of open access really makes things so much easier. 
also to get feedback where you know, generally get emails or sometimes postcards from faculty all over the world wanting to read reprints. And, you know, and I, I, I was sitting on my office today looking at all the reprints that I you know, haven't received for, for a journal article in years, which is something we don't do anyway. Uh, I think you know, the trend is going towards that. I think all of the big journals, big impact factors are going to as well. So you know, I think it's it's it, it's terrific. I, I, it's interesting you brought up the uh, the, the peer review um, transparency because I was reviewing a paper for a, for a, a very good journal, and I had no idea that they were going to publish my name and everything was going to be reviewed. And I actually declined at that point in time because I felt opposite to me if you know after I had written the review, there's a box to check saying I agree to make my Get rid of my anonymity, and then, uh, I, I left the box on check and went through it. And then uh, the editor came back and said, "Well, you know, it's not good. You should have told me first email." Um, so I think there's, you know, there's pluses and minuses uh, to that as well. I think that process is being able to turn. But definitely with open access, I think journal articles that would normally be read only by a very small number of people now are read by many, many people outside of your area. I see that as Um, so from from the student perspective, one of the nice things is that I have not personally had to worry about obtaining funding for publication costs or um, those kinds of things. That's generally been the responsibility of my advisor. Um, so when it comes to deciding whether I'm interested in publishing a paper open access or, or not, um, the number one question that I have to think about is, Basically, how is this going to help my career? Um, when thinking about that, there's um, a few things to consider. There's the impact factor of the journal, which, so I'm not mentioning these in any specific order, like most importantly, it's important, but impact factor, um, how many citations your paper can get, and then also um, how many papers can I actually produce during you know, this time during my PhD. Um, and all of those are important um, when I, you know, decide to move on in my career. Um, and as and as uh, Dr. Omal mentioned earlier, um, especially for young professors, um, and also I would I would mention also PhD students, um, the number of citations that you that you get um, tends to be very important. And there's also a known, um, you know number of citations bump that you get with publishing open access. Um, <clears throat> so um, we'll talk about also my experience with um, consuming open access articles. Um, it's definitely true that in the developing world it's important, you know, there might not be access to these uh, um, non-open access journals um, and such things. Um, but I've also found that um, having open access, even you know, as a as a student at GW, um, being able to access open, being able to access open access articles has been really nice. Um, particularly because the way that I the way that I have started to consume um, scientific articles, uh, most I'd say that now most of most of the time when I'm finding out about a new study or something, it's I, I'm I'm finding it on my Twitter feed. So when you're when you're on your cell phone, you're not necessarily able to, you know, access the GW network. I don't I'm not sure if the library has a way that you can actually access uh, journals through your cell phone. But if you click on the Twitter link and it, and it takes you to a paywall, um, you know, I usually end up not looking at that paper. Whereas if I can if I click on it, it's an open access it's an open access article. I can go directly and start to read that article on my phone. Um, and I think that's like a consideration also with, you know, these changes in the way that we're consuming, um, consuming science, the scientific literature. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention really quickly is that um, um, I'm a computational biologist, and so a lot, in addition to pub producing publications, a lot of what we do is producing 
software. Um, software is, um, by many journals and also depending on your funding sources, software is often required to be open source anyways. Um, so in some sense, I think that if you're, if you're going to put out software, your software is going to be open source. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to put out a piece of software where the users are not going to be able to look at the paper and figure out like what you're doing with the software. So I think that that's um, when you're when you're releasing software that is open source. I would say that it makes sense to go with an open access journal um, for publishing your algorithms and those kinds of things. We have any questions from the audience to start? Please, and, and I'll repeat them so that the people online hear them. Can any of you all speak to uh, Okay, so we have a question from the audience about author rights and has anyone encountered a situation where it was an open access journal and in theory they retain copyright but the open access journal actually retained all the distribution rights and other rights such as that. Speakable to that. I honestly haven't encountered a license that's that restrictive. That feels really restrictive. I've seen some journals that will um, more like an embargo on the on the author where after 12 months um, you can then put it in your institutional repository, you can put it on your website, but they will block you for that 12 months even though you maintain the copyright. I know that certain organizations like Anne had mentioned SPARC, the Scholarly Publishing and Research Coalition, um, they've actually put together materials that authors can use to negotiate with publishers so that they can look more, and it's written in plain English which is nice, um, I can't navigate the legally but you would take that to your publisher and try to negotiate for more rights. Um, so that's called the Google or the Google Spark Author Amendment, and that will come up pretty easily. I would follow up with that question. So you had the experience where it was three thousand, but you paid five thousand. So what did you get for three thousand versus five thousand? And I think that might address some of your question too. So the particular journal we were going to put this article in would grant a Creative Commons, share alike, so if you, if anyone else wanted to use it, they had to use it in the same way. It was non-commercial, so it meant that no one else could reuse that content and make money. And then I believe it was non-derivative, so they couldn't make derivatives with that work. This is an interesting um, publication because it was written in collaboration with Wikipedia. And so it was a paper about the use of Wikipedia at UCSF. It's taught in their curriculum. And Wikipedia is an open access resource. You can take Wikipedia content and reuse it. You can make a book. You can make a Wikipedia book. You can do pretty much whatever you want with it. And kind of the deal we had with Wikipedia going in was, of course, we would publish to the same degree of openness that Wikipedia did. So the journal came back and said, for $3,000, you know, you guys can have it open, but we're going to lock you down on all these other things. And we decided as a group not to not to do that, so we negotiated. They actually, the Walters Kluwer Journal, they had to kind of go figure out what they could do. They weren't used to publishing that, or authors asking to pay more uh, for this ability to do that. It's, it's an interesting question. We had another question on this side of the room. Yes, uh, I prefer that the title of the activity is Wikipedia Open Well, we have a department chair here who's behind open access, so perhaps. I'm actually happy to talk about that. Um, I had some few things in my notes before I came in and I didn't get to them. 
Uh, but I do think there is a nefarious side to open access. And that side is some of what uh, I think Travis talked about earlier about all these requests that we get to be on editorial boards of journals that nobody has heard about. And oftentimes, many of these journals have their names that are kind of one word off from a very prestigious name. So on very quickly looking at the journal title, you wouldn't be able to tell that it was not that journal. Uh, and I can tell you that, you know, uh, so I'll just um, confess uh, uh, to my own sins, which is that, you know, when I review for, uh, say, NIH on grant proposals, the National Institute of Health, uh, you know, as a reviewer, I'm given seven, eight, nine applications to review sometimes. And, uh, you know, um, I think as any other reviewer, I'm always looking for sort of cognitive shortcuts that will help me, uh, you know, uh, figure out which applicant is noteworthy, is very prestigious, has done wonderful work in the past. And one of the cues that I use is how many publications that person has on their CV, right? And at that point, I don't have the mental bandwidth to say, is this JAMA as in JAMA, or JAMA as JAMA offshoot that is made to look like JAMA, and is an open access, you pay $3,000, and there's not even a peer review. Um, I, I don't have that luxury, because I'm doing so many reviews, and so I, take it for granted that that's the legitimate jam, just to use that as an example. And I think there are, you know, um, I would imagine that, and someone must have done studies on this already, uh, I would imagine that uh, this is probably also the case when it comes to tenure review, when it comes to promotion review. Uh, you know, we're all overworked and we're looking for shortcuts. And uh, so there's, there's that, that, you know, how do we, do we distinguish the truly good, open access journals, of which there are many, I should add, from the really sort of the opposite of that. So that's one. Uh, the other is that I think in many fields, um, even now, uh, uh, the peer acceptable journals in that field are still not open access. And, you know, if you publish in those journals, your prestige goes up, you know, your, your cachet goes up, uh, now, the, I think the good news on that front is that many of the more traditional journals that we have come to rely on over the years have an open access component to their work. So that is always a safe bet, but not all journals have gotten there yet. Um, just to add on that, I agree. A lot of journals have the open access component. The one downside to that is that that's great. You might pay the $3,000 for that article, however, your GW library still needs to buy that entire publication. So now what you've had happen is um, your university, GW has now paid once for that article and they're going to pay for it again um, through their subscription. So the publishers have found out how to make this a, a, pro a profit margin off this because they're kind of double dipping in some cases. Um, so that, that was kind of what I was talking about, the hybrid journals. So you, you, know, you step forward, you pay the fee, and then the publisher opens the game. I forgot to say at the very beginning, um, because I'm at Informed Services University, today I'm just representing myself and not the federal government or the department. I'm going to follow up on your question with Matthew. Do you think there's a generation gap where there's a greater acceptance of open access with the up-and-coming PhD students versus the more established professionals? Um, I'm not so sure about that. So my advisor is actually an early adopter and very much very much encourage us to look at access from the, from the beginning. Um, I did advisory and we adopt a lot of their, a lot of their ideas. Um, but I would, I would guess that there is a case. So my peers are very used to getting, you know, being able to get everything, you know, on the internet, get it very quickly, get it for free. Whereas, like, you know, I mean, everything from Wikipedia to journal articles, Okay. I think uh, really you have to be careful about having like 
these things to lump together is we're, there's a difference between all the new online journals and kind of the, the change of accessing information um, that open access gets lumped into, right? So all these dubious journals happen to be open access because you have to, their business models, someone has to pay the bill. Um, but I mean, I think the open access question is, I'm, I'm probably guilty of this by speaking about this first, is that, you know, that it's a different, it's a different discussion. And I agree with all the preparation of journals, even when we're reviewing faculty candidates, you know, I'm as guilty as anyone of looking at the journal and saying that, you know, is that a real journal, you know, even in the back of my mind? And I think a lot of that, as I mentioned before, I think you have to give time. Certain journals, um, lost ones are a fine journal. I've seen some questionable papers in there as much as I've seen questionable papers in, in New England Journal and JAMA, probably more so with those because they're more you know, high impact but perhaps rushed too far to, to get the press too quickly. So I, I do think there's a bias against online journals in general. Um, but I do think that eventually will, will go away as you know more people publish in a certain journal, the impact factor goes up in the site. So I think that's just a little happen organically perhaps. Do you have any questions online? Make sure I'm not. I had one, one other sort of, um, which is not um, in fever or against open access, but my experience has been actually the health issue. But we have PubMed, right? And in PubMed, you can get abstracts so of most articles are relevant. Uh, it's been my personal experience that when I read an abstract, so oftentimes when I'm doing my own business, I'm relying on those abstracts to text a lot. So I don't have time to read the actual content of uh, all of the articles. Uh, and then when I read the abstract, I go, oh, yeah, you know, I, I want to look at this article in more depth. I want the full depth. If it's not available to me through GW, sometimes that happens. If you don't have a journal, I write to the article. To the author. And I have never had people turn it down. They actually send me the full text. Most of them are happy to do so. I get requests from my articles. I'm more than happy to send them the full text. So it may, I think many articles, I just use the health domain, and that's really I just talked about. Uh, I think many articles are actually open access. Take the time to write to the author. I just wanted to mention that um, so like websites like ResearchGate do in that like they enable you to search for search for um, a journal article and then actually just send a message to that and I've gotten um, you know I've had that I've had that go both ways. Other popular news press thing that comes out. Uh, many studies are irreproducible. You can't reproduce them. The latest thing out. And so I do think you're starting to see um, you know, the idea of putting more data online. You know, that's actually truly, in my opinion, open you know, science data. The fear, of course, is you put your data out there, um, you can steal it, publishing anyway, so you steal it and publish. So I think that's. In a comfortable area, I think, for a lot of scientists. Like, I also see trends is going to be even more open than the journals already are asking for you know, genetic confirmation of the cell line. It's really just all you think it is. They kind of probably have not been for some time. I think there's, a, there's that aspect of it. I think the publishing is also being open and divulging, you know, in many ways, the uh, basic data. Yeah. I think eventually, I, um, I can add that on Monday night, I heard Patty Brennan, who is the director of the National Library of Medicine, Dr. Patty Brennan, and she was speaking on apparently the National Library of Medicine will be taking over the NIH big data initiative, and she had a lot of really interesting things to say about th this is where we're going to be, and, and it's either going to be not just the basic science data, but the electronic health record and all kinds of other information out there, and it's going to change how we think about evidence-based practice. I had um, a couple of questions, if no one else does, but we have another question from the audience. That's okay. I have some, too. Now you go. Um, could you speak to the type of creative 
I just, that's, this is the creativecommons.org is where you go. And the reason I brought it up was if you don't know about the licenses, they have the section here, choose your license. And it will take you through steps and ask the questions to help you figure out which license it is you want. That's kind of fun if you're not, not sure how free you want to go <laughs> with Creative Commons. I think there's a need to make a time field. You, you fight so you know you fight so hard in many ways to get your you know your paper accepted into the quote unquote best journal that you, you know, hope to get into. And I think when the battle is over, you know, I do think you know perhaps that's where and I think also coming from a time where there was no question about you know anything with all you know, the page charges and advertising, et cetera. So I think I would argue probably the vast majority of the time it's not that they don't care. I think it's just something that probably has not gone. I think yeah, anyone would be upset if their paper ended up in a written book um, and someone saw it in public. Um, but they probably also didn't know that they don't have the right to do it. So that I, I can guarantee you probably most people have not going to consider when they're getting accepted and clicking all the boxes. Um, when you talk about open access and open data and open software, I don't know if Dr. O'Brien might want to address this, but um, one of the best examples of open openness and sharing is the National Center for Biotechnology Information with all of the gene databases, the protein databases, and that's all stuff where people can actually make a profit, is my understanding, because some of that stuff, you might be building a patent into something from it. And um, so, I don't know if you wanted to address that at all. That's obviously a huge topic. Uh -huh.
I agree with that. I think basically without NCBI and without the, op op the data that they've made available, like we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be able to do half the projects, probably less, probably like most of the projects that we do in the Computational Biology Institute. I, I regularly use all of those resources very heavily, and a lot of times, if you publish a study, you put your data out there, maybe you're worried about somebody else uh, taking that data and making money off it, but a lot of times, when those people are, are using your data, they are, they are also adding value to it. One of the software programs that I'm working, right now, working on right now in the Nixon lab is, is uh, basically designed to take this, take RNA-seq data that people are discarding and to use that data to find new inferences about, about the same, same biological material that they originally studied. Yes, in a sense, I'm, I'm taking their data, but I'm also adding a lot of value to it. I'm not generating the data myself, so, which, but it's really nice to have those resources available. Yeah, I think that uh, NIH, other funding mechanisms are, are really pressing for people to put all of their data out there so that you know, the maximum information can be gained for basically for everybody. I wanted to go back with my one question that I had. Um, we talked a little bit about the global impact in terms of researchers in less developed areas of the world or maybe even rural areas in the United States having access to more literature because of open access. Has anyone, is anyone aware of a pattern where they're having an opportunity? There's research going on in developing countries. Um, Dr. Rahman and I were talking about Malawi and there's a lot going on there. Are these people having a better chance to publish because of open access and to get their research out there? Any thoughts on that? Probably, is my uh, sort of uh, reaction to that. Uh, I know that in the 10 to 15, about 15 years that um, I've worked globally, the access that my global partners have to information, uh, to uh, uh, peer-reviewed articles, has gone up astronomically, um, especially in the last five to six years. Uh, in the beginning, I remember having to send you know, packets of uh, articles, and I, have, I can't remember the last time I did that. Uh, I would imagine that, you know, the, uh, with global work, especially work that is funded by U.S. entities that's taking place in various parts of the world, I think the bigger issues are ownership of the data, um, and because usually those data come back to the U.S without really leaving any opportunities for local researchers to use them. I think that's a, to me, that's a much bigger issue than mm -hmm. one of open access, which I feel now it's far more open than it ever used to be. Okay. Just to tag on that too, I think there are, um, it probably does open people's ability to access literature abroad, but then just to bring it closer to home, I had the opportunity to learn work with a lot of community-based organizations and NGOs and also government agencies that are making policy, and they also did not have access to the information, and they're creating policy based on an abstract. That's kind of scary if they can't get it. We would often get calls to our library, like, hey, can you help us get these? They're our neighbors, they're, and we just couldn't get them access. Or they were the people that we were studying, and we couldn't let, we didn't have, they didn't have access to read the paper that was about them. And so I think we really need to, yes, it's very important. I think everyone has access, but it's not just a global concern. It's very much a local concern. So open access makes it available to everybody across many different levels. Is there any other questions online or from the audience? So the question is, what is the impact of open access when you're coming up for promotion and tenure? Yeah, but I do think, in terms of um, that we can, you know, I mean, obviously, you're being judged on where you publish. And again, I think we have to be careful. All open access, there's online journals and open access. But yeah, so I think that's, I think the question comes down to the proliferation of journals that are now online and the access you have, especially theory getting even your terrible, terribly run study published in some journal. I think that's probably is that the question you're all. About open access or is it about online journals? 
it's going to depend on your field. Um, there's just some heavy hitter titles people are looking for. Um, I would also say I used to compile promotion and tenure packets for other faculty members. And we would always get, we want citations and we want the journal impact factor. Um, it's been interesting because certain journals that are open now are having quite high um, impact factors. So something like uh, PLOS Medicine, I think it's like about a 17 right now, which then dwarfs a lot of other journals, but it is open. So it'll be interesting as the P&T committees try to parse out what's important. And um, also just to piggyback on the Altmetric piece that you brought up, um, that's becoming a much bigger piece. And a lot of people don't, there's kind of an etiquette, you don't tweet, you don't post articles that are closed because it's frustrating when you hit it with your phone. Um, but places like Mayo are now integrating Altmetrics into the P&T dossier. So you're starting to see, could, could this make a difference? Like how is that coming into play? Well, we're nearing the end. Is there no more questions? Oh, there is another question. <laughs> So we have a question about preservation of online journals. I can talk a, a little bit about that. So there are initiatives underway. There's actually a, an initiative called LOX, Lots of Copies Keep Stuff Safe. NGW is a part of that. Right. Um, and what they're doing, they are, they are archiving copies of articles so that we can ensure that we have them for future memory. Um, I know there is a publishing platform called the o Open Journal System, or OJS. There are 10,000 journals that sit on that. That enables small professional societies, different companies to put up journals. And I know that all of that content has just moved over into locks. So there's been a very active um, promotion of preservation that has been taken into account. It tends to be coming in through the libraries. So you think that locks and like portico are enough to preserve I don't think we'll ever be able to preserve 100%. I think we're giving it our best shot. Um, and I know a lot of universities and organizations have put a lot of funding into this and a lot of thinking about you know, data migration or all of the things to keep stuff safe. Um, and you did say you know, a publisher like Sage or elsewhere, I mean, we see publishers go under, publishers definitely go this under. Um, they tend to get their back files bought up, um, but it is, it's always a, a danger. Okay, so we had a question about publishers and what they open up. Elsevier is actually not so bad. What they will let you do is put the preprint in, which is the copy right before formatting. And it can go, we, for instance, at GW, we have an open access repository, and you could put it there, the preprint. And we're doing our best to preserve it. I will, I'll be honest. I mean, we're, everyone's doing their best to make sure online is preserved. Are we 100% sure? No, this is everything's changing and evolving, so we can't guarantee anything. I, I feel like what I would like to do to close is to ask the panelists. Um, we've heard a lot of really interesting things about open data, open review. We heard kind of two different opinions about open review of articles um, and different ideas about funding models. So. Where do you see the publishing landscape? And I'd like each of you to address this. In five to ten years, will we be strictly open access? Will there still be publishers? Will they be gone? Will there be new ways to publish? People are talking about revival of university presses as a way to get stuff out there. So I just kind of would like to ask you all, where do you see it? Well, I, I, can, I don't want to project because I think all my projections come out wrong. But, um, I think uh, we're all going to be surprised. I can, I can talk about what I hope will happen, uh, which is that I'm actually – I'm not going to hope that everything becomes open access uh, because someone has to pay for that. And if there is money involved in getting something published, that's going to create a form of censorship among, particularly among departments that are not known for you know, going out and getting funding uh, in, the, in many disciplines in the arts and sciences. You know, grant getting is not part of the deal. 
Uh, and so there isn't money to go out and publish in open access journals. And so if we move as, uh, as a field only to open access journals, then lots of people will be left behind. Uh, lots of authors will not be able to get their work published, and I think that would be a shame. Uh, I'm hopeful that universities will take a bigger role in creating that content, in subsidizing some of those costs. Uh, and I think that, you know, for the longest time, many big publishers, publishing institutions, have frankly taken advantage of authors um, because of the compunction to get published, uh, above and beyond everything else. And I think authors have been put in a very bad place for many, many years, and that's changing. Uh, but I really do hope that universities can take a bigger role in um, subsidizing some of those costs. Um, I would definitely agree. I think right now we're in an unsustainable model. We're seeing that labs can't cover the, the high APC charges, especially in biomedicine. We're seeing that the libraries can't afford the subscriptions. We're seeing record high profit from some of the publishers. So I know some of the things that have been proposed are more cooperative models where the, unity, the universities get together and they work through agreements to maximize what they're able to buy together. The other piece of this that I've always thought is interesting is that unlike other fields, the academics really do all of the work in academic publishing. Like I'm serving as an editor, which I'm doing you know, as a component of my work, but I, I'm not getting paid to be an editor. I know some editors do get paid. Reviewers don't get paid. We're doing all of that work. Our universities are paying for it. Our tax dollars are paying for it. I don't think that's going to be a sustainable model. As we see this explosion of journals, I continually get requests to review from legitimate journals as well that there's no way I could ever keep up with. So I think we do need to have some changes. I would love to see the universities start to throw their weight around a little bit more because ultimately we're paying the bills. And the NIH is paying the bill through overheads that come in on our grants. So I think it's, it's kind of tough uh, times that we start to look at other options we may have. We've been in this model for a very long time, and I think it's time to look at it and kind of come together as the, the purchasers and the creators. Well, said, I can't really add anything other than what I already, say, I already said, which I think uh, it'll be a hybrid and this market-based system that will always be in play. I think, uh, uh, just to reiterate, I, I think we might see things changing and what the expectation is of the authors in terms of divulging the data. I think that's where you might, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of arguments for and against, uh, especially with the competitive grant environment, where mm -hmm. I don't think NIH budget is being doubled. Well, I think we have our next uh, seminar, data science. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I do think that's, yeah, that's where you might see more, you know, not just open access, but open access to data as well. If nothing else, to make sure that the results are actually reproducible. Yeah, I definitely agree with everything that's been said. I think that it is going to be more open access to to data that's really going to drive drive things forward. You know, basically giving everybody an opportunity to take a look take a look at the data to um, and then to ensure reproducibility. That's going to be huge. A lot of the journals now are asking for extensive documentation of how, for example, analyses are run. Um, basically enough that somebody can actually reproduce the data and reproduce the results. And I think that that's only going to be possible with more availability of open data and data sharing and such things that are really going to help everybody move forward. Any other questions or comments? And I want to thank the panel for this is a really terrific discussion, very informative, and we thank you very much.